Buonasera. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Linda Campani. I'm the director, for those of you who might not know me, I'm the director of the Sanford University program here in Florence. Um, as you, some of you know, I see familiar faces. We have a lecture series that meets every Wednesday afternoon, or almost every Wednesday afternoon. But this year, as part of this lecture series, we're also hosting a few uh, very meaningful, important talks celebrating the 800 years of life of the Familia Capponi in Florence. So uh, we had a wonderful talk. We had a wonderful talk uh, which opened the series this past March, on March 25, which was given by Professor Timothy Verdon. And we are hosting now our second talk, which will be given by Count Niccolò Capponi. Uh, before we uh, go there, however, I'd like to introduce the man who will be introducing Niccolò Capponi. Uh, 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 and I have lots of pieces of paper. Uh, in fact, I'm going to introduce Count Sebastiano Capponi, who is the brother of Niccolò Capponi, and who's here almost by sheer chance because he was in Paris this morning and tried to get to Florence or the Pisa airport this afternoon. I think it just got here. So thank you for being with us tonight. Count Sebastiano Caponi is the 20th generation of the Caponi family to run the family-owned estate and winery Villa Calcinaia, which is located at Greve in Chianti. At Villa Calcinaia, he has been responsible for wine production, product development, public relations and marketing, international distribution, labor, land, and property management. Villa Calcinaia, just to give you a sense, produces well over 8,000 cases a, a year, and that includes uh, the Chiatti Classico, Chiatti Classico Riserva, Casarsa, Comitale, and Vinsanto. In his capacity as winemaker, Count Sebastiano Caponi has participated in a number of wine and trade fairs, including Vina Expo, Vin Italy, Pro Wine, the Cincinnati Wine Festival, Gusto, and a number of other events sponsored by the Consortio Chianti Classico. Count Sebastiano is, uh, together with his entire family, but he is extremely critical for this program, for Stanford University of Florence, because it was with him that we conducted the uh, entire transaction that brought Stanford University to this location. So we owe a great, uh, we have a great debt of gratitude towards the entire Caponi family for allowing Stanford University to take its home in Florence in this wonderful place. Uh, because I can assure you that having come here has truly affected the uh, nature of our program. It has not merely been a change of address. We were located in one of our you know, we've been located in a number of places, but one of our last locations was not far from here. But it is thanks to Palazzo Capone that we do a number of things uh, that we had not even been able to dream of before. So we have a great debt of gratitude towards the entire family and towards Sebastiano Capone in particular because he was there fighting with me over costs and things and going back and forth. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and again, uh, Count Sebastiano Caponi indeed has another uh, role because he has, in addition to wine, he has experience in real estate. And specifically, he's been uh, in charge of the refurbishment and development of historical properties, more specifically, and in particular, of this palazzo, Palazzo Caponi alle Rovinate, the Palazzo La Riori de Valli, and the Canigiani Palazzo, both uh, of whom are not far from here. Uh, his educational background includes a degree in political science from the University of Florence, and he's been very much in touch with that university because he is a partner of a project for the preservation of minor, minor grape varieties, varieties, that's a word that I can enter, a mi minor grapes variety native to the county area. This is just with the University of Florence. Uh, he's also a member of the Florentine District of the State Bar of Agricultural Entrepreneurs. 
the Academia dei Giardofili, the board of the Consortium Classico, which, as you well know, is an organization that represents the producers of anti classical wine that controls its production and promotes it all over the world. He's also a member of the Knights of St. Stephen, Stephen, a Tuscan order of chivalry. So thank you for being with us, uh, Count Caponi, and please come to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Professor Campani for this wonderful pre presentation and Stanford University for hosting this series of conferences about my family history. Um, my family started a long time ago in Florence in 1215. We were merchants back then, then we became bankers, and then, of course, we sold the last bank in Lyon 1596. Four. 1994, sorry. <laughs> I got the story right in front of me. And uh, then we became gentlemen. From a business standpoint, everything went south. So I'm the first member of the family, after many generations, actually hands-on in the winemaking and the viticultural management of the estate. <coughs> and uh, kind of uh, fell upon me when I was only 21 years old. Uh, must understand in my family, the delegation is brought to an art. So my father was once saw me talking to a German customer and he thought over and said, oh, it's all yours. So when I was 21 years old and I started, to, I was still university, and I started running the estate. Uh, I always tell this to people, you know, people in life, they get a degree, then they get married, they have a child, and then they get a driving, uh, and then first of all, they get a driving license, then degree, then married, and then get to have a child. I, took the reverse course. I had a child, I got married, I got my university degree, and then I got my driving license as last. I was tired, I was tired of getting buses to go back and forth from Calcinaia to, to Florence. And um, so there's always been an intellect, intellectual approach to the winemaking as well. And uh, I took care of winemaking for 10 years. So for 10 years, from 1992, the only thing I took care of was production. And then in 2002, I started, you know, took my uh, my uh, my suitcase and started traveling the world to sell the wine. So, in, in terms of intellectual approach, of course, um, other members of my family uh, delved in that, and one of which is my brother. So I remember it was not like four or five years ago. My brother came to the winery and said, "Oh, I have this wonderful discovery." I found this recipe on how to make wine following the French style and written by our ancestor in, 16, in 1613. And I thought, oh my God, another <coughs> unproductive activity. Um, but you must understand that in a brotherly pairing, I am the female and he's the male. So he's got the vision and I take care of the nitty gritty details. <laughs> and uh, so we decided to, uh, to proceed and to follow this, uh, this recipe. And we started doing it in 2000, the first vintage was 2011, and repeated the experiment in 2013. And uh, it's a very different way of making wine from what, I, from what I've learned and from what I knew. Uh, I would say only this, that the wine that came out, it's very, very pleasant. It's a very pleasant, but you will taste it afterwards and maybe you will share, maybe you will share my opinion, maybe not. But uh, it, it is quite amazing how, you know, make you, when you, it was with cooking, you know, you think that your recipe is the right one and then somebody comes up and says, oh, you may twist and turn this and, you know, it will come as well, or maybe a little different, but maybe as good as the one or the original one. And you sometimes you fail to believe that because you're set in your ways. So it's, it was very refreshing to, to do, you know, to replicate a recipe of, of winemaking that it was 400 years old and to see that actually the outcome was really, really good. So I'll leave my brother to the uh, more kind of a historical part and also the um, and also the presentation of the wine and why we did it and uh, thank you for coming today and uh, hope to see you later bye bye let's take the thing okay Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for being here.
thanks to the director, Dr. Campani, and to the staff of Stanford University in Florence for their daring exploit of having talking. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Campani, every time I meet one of uh, some of the students, is terrorized that I shall utter something that is totally politically incorrect. <laughs> and I promise today I will be on my best South Park behavior. <laughs> Uh, my brother said correctly that, oh, how does this, is it working, is it not working? I'll have it. Oh. Okay, yes, this is the, uh, you see, the, the, the family logo of the winery. Uh, Conti Caponi, yes, I found this. I need a better one because that mauve and the, and the coronet is rather sort of cheap. Uh, it has been our family business for a long time. Uh, we go back to 1524, May 1524, still have the contract for that one. Uh, of course, uh, industrially, we have been making it since the 60s, like everybody, with very few exceptions, nobody in Tuscany and nobody in Italy made wine in the modern sense. We didn't. The socio-economic structure of winemaking <coughs> just did not fit. <laughs> yes. Um, this one, I think I've got it wrong somehow. It works, but it's a little bit weird sometimes. You see, my brother says that in the family I am the man, and, correct, and he's correct in that, and he is the woman. <laughs> he's also correct in that, I would say. Uh, yes, uh, although I mean, probably would prefer Mary Tudor than Elizabeth Tudor, but you know, I couldn't find a good portrait of Mary Tudor. Uh, but when it comes to wine, and this particular project of wine that you're seeing here, and I will show you, uh, called the 1613, it was really a synergic effort between us two. I found the recipe thanks to Dr. I knew of his existence, Dr. Giovanna Lazzi of the Biblioteca di Cardiana. Uh, Sebastiano was, of course, none too keen at the beginning, and I can understand why. I mean, especially in this day and age, uh, where money is tight, and always is tight, and there are only three ways of losing your money, women gambling and winemaking. <laughs> uh, which women being the most pleasant, gambling the quickest, and winemaking the shortest, uh, you can understand the reluctance. But we did this also as a homage to history, to family history. And also because the booklet that, from which the recipe is taken was a bestseller for its time. It ran, it ran through five editions, which, I mean, considering how the printing press worked at the time, was not bad. You see, it's not bad. Oh, which the most uh, common and I would say popular edition is the 1613 edition. But it starts at sea. This recipe starts at sea. Here we are at the Battle of Levant of 1571. When, we, when the Ottoman advance in the Mediterranean was stopped. But already some years before, you can see the Ottoman Empire, how it was expanding and how it was threatening the Italian coasts. Here, yeah. this is the Ottoman Empire, more or less, you can see on the various thing, but the maximum expansion is where it's green. And the Ottoman Empire and its satellite states have been engaging in naval warfare, especially in raiding along the Italian coasts, and not only the Italian coasts, carrying away property, livestock, and people. In order to... Now, it is one of the rules of raiding and one of the rules of terrorism that 
to fight it, you need counter-raiding and you need counter-terrorism. What is the scope of raiding, essentially? Putting your adversary on the defensive. Counter-raiding is throwing the ball in the other court. And for this reason, this little man, this man here, Cosimo I of Medici, in 1561 created, with papal approval, the order of the Knights of St. Stephen of Tuscany. He had taken over Tuscany, the whole of Tuscany, with Siena in 1555, although Siena was a Spanish fief. And as a matter of fact, there's no such thing as a Grand Duchy of Tuscany until 1737. And the Medici is always careful to talk about I Serenissimi Stati. Never the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, but I Serenissimi Stati because they don't want, want to be beholden to anybody. The Knights of St. Stephen, here you see an illustration, who, uh, after a rather shaky start, uh, started delivering the goods, especially under this gentleman here, who is Ferdinando the I, the Medici, uh, a man of guts, of power, former cardinal, yes, uh, married to Christina Lorraine, and a very good administrator. And somebody that, as soon as he came to the Tuscan throne in 1587, understood that for reasons of prestige and for reasons of just survival and economic of survival, you need to boost what you need to boost what you already had, and that was the fleet. And the fleet met the Knights of St. Stephen with their galleys. This is one of them. This is actually a 17th century galley that gives you very much the idea of what a galley looked like. Now, despite what they may have, you may have read, uh, life as a galley oarsman was not that bad. As a matter of fact, it depended, sometimes it was even better than what you found on land. The problem is that in in the Western Mediterranean, even if you were free rower, you were chained to the bench. <laughs> and not in Venice. Mm. In Venice, you were free rower, you were free. And uh, that's why there was this Moorish uh, free man. He was a black Moor, as described at the time. Uh, and he was offered to become a spalier, it was the leading oarsman in a, in a galley. And he said, no, not in Tuscany. Oh yes, you paid me very well, but I have no intention to be chained to a bench. So I prefer less money with my freedom. Also, uh, it's like if the galley goes down and you're chained to a bench, you go down with the galley. I mean, <laughs> this sort of unwilling Titanic situation. <laughs> the galleys and you all know, you can get an idea of how, uh, this is not a very good photograph, but how the galley fleet and the Warner was organized. Now, Galley warfare involved hunter-killer operation. You try to get other galleys, stop raiders in their tracks. Interrupting trade, in this case trade amongst the various Barbary states and even with the Ottoman Empire and its dependencies. And of course, raiding. The raid of Algiers is famous in 1604 because according to Tuscan propaganda, we blew up the entire Algerian fleet. As a matter of fact, we only blew up one galley. But you know, <laughs> for the sake of propaganda, I mean, you could inflate numbers a bit. Uh, and the celebrated capture of Borna, which is Anaba in, in Tunisia. The famous Anaba, actually it's Algiers, Algeria, is, the, is Hippo of Agustine fame. The taking of Borna was one of the key moments in the history of the Order of St. Stephen. This is from the Rome of Borna, as it is in the Palazzo Pitti, the frescoes by Pocetti. And what is interesting, at the expedition of Borna and all, and commanding a galley at the time, was Captain Nicola Capponi. Captain Nicola Caponi, we don't have his portrait, but we have his armor, at least part of it, which is there. Uh, yes, the upper part, at least. 
the rest, death is, the armor is real, but it's fake. In the sense, it's, the pieces are authentic, but it was put together in the 19th century, and the legs are a century earlier than the upper part, you see. That's because everybody wanted to have a full suit of armor, so you always found the Bardini of the time who were prepared to deliver the goods. Um, yes, oh, that's my son up there. This is protesting. Uh, so, Captain Nicola Capoli was at sea since 1587, roughly, when he became a knight of St. Stephen. As a, as a page, actually, at the age of 14, and did a number of campaigns. The problem with Captain Nicola Capponi is that he liked, liked his trade too much. And you know, anybody can tell you that if you're abroad, you, 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 don't, you don't mix with the boys, you don't network, you do, you're not near the centre of power, and you get left out. And this is exactly what happened to Captain Nicola Capone. At a certain point, despite the fact that he was quite an efficient and I would say even brilliant galley captain, he was out of the inner circle. So, around 1608, he decided to get married, found a wife with a very good diary, 10,000 scudi, which was no mean a diary at the time, although by the end of the, 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 end of the century, at the end of the 17th century, 10,000 scudi was a pittance. Yes. Even dowries to enter nunneries increase. I mean, so much of being cheap not to marry your daughter. No, it was not cheap. <laughs> Sending your, your daughter to a nunnery was damn expensive. But it was a good career. A very good career. It became an abbess of uh, an important monastery that maybe had extensive holdings in Tuscany. You were a power. And if you would tell a bishop to go to hell, and the bishop went to hell, well, we can also think not just metaphorically sometimes. <laughs> but that is in the hands of God. As I say, we don't have a portrait of Nicola Capone. We have a portrait of his father, Giovanni Battista. He's up there. The photograph is not that good. But Senator who had inherited, uh, well, you still, as a young man, the property of Calcinaia. This is the original map when we bought the estate, the four farms of Poderi. A Poderi is an agricultural, um, I would say, uh, subdivision that indicates what a family of workers can work in a year. So it's like a potere, what in the sense of being able to do. A potere, as a potere, could be a variable size, and also depends on parts of Tuscany. It also depends on a potere in, in the Pisa Valley would be a rich potere. A potere in the Casentino, well, you died of hunger there. In, in the Chianti, you were, for the standard of time, well off, by the standard of time. The four Poderi, and do you see Calcinaia is in the bottom. Uh, San Pieno Alpino, Sepale, Bastignano, all, already a ruin and now has disappeared from the map. Although I may have found, thanks to US, uh, US Army Air Force aerial photographs of World War II, I may have found where it is because you can see from above the outline of the house. So, another thing to be thankful to the Yanks. <laughs> Catching eye as it is today, you see a fair cry from what it was at the time. Nice little place, although it is not a villa. No, it is not a villa. The real Florentine villa is half an hour from the city walls on horseback, <laughs> at most, and with a view of the city itself because those are the canons of the Renaissance. You must have the view. And the view of a always It is the mere requies of the Roman patrician, but it's the Roman patrician that was always meditating about his political career. You say, that this is not a villa, it's a fattoria. And until 
well, I was still a child, until 1965, the Fattoria was working also as, an, as a hospitality centre. Mm -hmm. People came with once with their carts, and they had to give them a meal, they had to give them a bed. We closed it in 1965, at that point truck drivers were stopping for their meals, and that sort of had defeated the purpose somewhat. Well, here in Calcinaia, Nicola Capponi started working, as his son wrote years later, murando e cultivando, building and cultivating, tilling, I would say. This treatise came out, the first edition was, I say, 1608, and the most popular one was 1613. It's anonymous, and so it would have remained if, until the, 19th, the 18th century, Giovanni Taggioni Tuzzetti had not attributed the treatise to Nicola Capponi. There actually were, there were a number of candidates. But Paolo Mini, already in 1596, was writing about the wines done in the French style by Mr. Nicolò Caproni, che sono più grassi e saporiti dei nostri. Okay, there was one Nicolò di Filippo who was Mini's patron. The problem is that Mini is writing in the present, and when he published his book, Nicolò di Filippo was as dead as a nail. And the only candidate left was Nicolò Nicola Caponi, who, by the way, had, been, had traveled extensively to France because Tuscan galleys <coughs> normally would stop in Marseille when they used to tour the Western Mediterranean because of the wine. Yes, despite what we may think, uh, French wine was popular in Tuscany and French style wine was popular what were known as i chiaretti alla francese the cl claret the French at the time had a habit of making their wine by keeping the juice less in contact for a lesser time I'd say in contact with the with, uh, skins. with the skins than they did in Italy. As a result, the wines were lighter in colour. And exactly what Captain Nicola Caponi advocated in his pamphlet. Keep the skins and the juice together not more than 36 hours. We know it is the treatise is also interesting because it tells us by omission how they made wine in Italy. And that is interesting. A lot of times, what is not stated is actually more interesting than what is stated. The problem was, when it came to us to reproduce this wine, how, what? Things have changed. The climate has changed. The I mean, the way in which you plant your vineyards has changed. Remember, once they were planted by hand and the roots were much nearer to the surface than they are today. As a result, the impact of the sun was greater than it is today. Also, in the old fields, which you had to, uh, much more uh, wider spaces between each row of vines, the impact, again, of the sun was greater. And also, which were rattles. Well, Giovanni Vittorio, Giovanni Vittorio Soderini in 1598, and this book was published posthumously in 1600, lists a number of grapes that were used in Tuscany at the time. We don't know what grapes were used in Calcinai at the time, but we presume that they were more or less the same. Remember, also at the time, the wine in the Chianti style was done nearly exclusively with Canaiolo. Uh, my brother has brought some bottles of rosé, and so what you will be drinking is probably the nearest thing you can get to a Chianti old style, although it's not Chianti. 
today. The only thing you can get to a Canto style made it through the Louis de Canayon. So, Giovanni Bertardo talks about San Giovese, talks about very positively about Mappolo, a grape that had nearly disappeared. It was only used in blends. But Giovanni Vittorio Soderini, un ottimo uva per fare il vino. What he says che il San Giovito è buono. And San Giovito, of course, is a difficult grape. He talks about Canaiolo, praises Canaiolo. Doesn't mention many whites, but of course, Malvasia was universal. The reason why he doesn't mention it is because, again, white was considered to be white wine, the absolute acme of everything. Contracts, shareholding contracts in the Middle Ages usually specify that all the white grapes have to go to the owner. Just think how things have changed today. <laughs> because because of Galenic medicine, it was considered that a white wine was better for your humours, was more balancing. Anybody, any doctor today will say that that is crap, you know, uh, medical, empirical medicine has taken over. So uh, we sort of understand the times. At the time, I say, Malvasia when if you had to mix white grapes with red, you would use Malvasia, and sometimes you would use Trebbiano. There is a problem, however, with these grapes. These are modern grapes. And also thanks to this little animal here. This is a cartoon by Pan from Punch, uh, 1890. It is the phylloxera, the connoisseur. Yes, because we forget that Europe in the second half of the 19th century, and Italy up to the first 40 years of the 20th century, was playing with phylloxera. Originally from the United States and America, the bug that attacks the roots of the vines and withers them as a result. 90% of all the vines from the Atlantic to the Rhine were killed. Yes. As a result, uh, Cabernet was planted in Bordeaux, <laughs> and modern Bordeaux has nothing to do with 18th century Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. Which I use complete different grapes, but Cabernet is an easier grape to handle. Uh, Philoxena was less virulent in Italy, and when I asked uh, Mr. Berry, Berry Brothers and Rudd, uh, how did you survive with the crisis of, with the phylloxera crisis when you were importing French wines? And oh, we survived very well. As the French survived, they were making their wine with Algerian <laughs> wine, with Italian, southern Italian wine, as they always do, of course. Um, but anyhow, in Italy, phylloxera, as I say, was less virulent. But because it was less virulent, the crisis lasted longer. It was this reason because the way in which you planted your vineyards was different than in France. In France, you, one row courted everybody, everything courted. In Tuscany, not necessarily so, because the distance between a row and the other was such that sometimes the bug died before it could reach the next row, you see. But still, the, the phylloxera crisis created a panic in some cases. Uh, vines were uprooted and replanted, grafted on American vines that were resilient to phylloxera. So a lot of varietals have been lost, and a lot of clones of known varietals have been lost. So in a sense, it was always speculation. We used grapes that were known at the time, but can we be sure that they are the same grapes? No, we can't. It's the nearest thing we can do. Remember, archaeology, more even more than history, is trying to open your window on the past. And it, you hope that it will have the best view possible. But remember, it is only partial. Even if it's the best view, it, is, it, it, will, it will always be only a partial view. And you can do the best you can. 
Cap uh, the other problem we had was uh, how to make the wine itself. Captain Nicola Caponi gives some indications. Interesting. He talks about French fermenting vats being taller and sort of narrower at the top than Italian ones. Here you can see an Italian fermenting vat. So people sort of stomping on the grapes. People still today who would love to come and do the harvest and stomp on the grapes. A, we have not been stomping on the grapes since World War I. <laughs> B, after one day in the field, you would sort of, this is a romantic notion of the of wine picking, which sort of would disappear in a flash. <laughs> I can tell you that. But this was actually it. And the other problem was that he says the first fermentation has to happen in in the vat. Then remove all the juice and put it in a barrel and cover the barrel with a leaf, a vine leaf, and put a stone on top of the leaf. So all the muck, he calls it, will bubble out. Well, the first year we thought that this was rather too daring. As a result, we had some problems. The following time we did it, in 1613, we just did everything according to recipe and it turned out beautifully. But you see, certain techniques we had lost. Very much like a mystery, as I always say, history is mystery. Not because it is mystery per se in a damn brown sense. <laughs> because things have been forgotten. There are so many passages in this house that have been walled up or interrupted. We know that they exist because we have floor plans of the 18th century. There is a, a spiral staircase, where is the bathroom down there? Yes, there was a spiral staircase. It's lost. But it doesn't mean it's secret because it's hidden. It's just secret because it's forgotten. And a lot of times these techniques were forgotten, sometimes because passed down from father to son, people leave the countryside, and this knowledge just withers away and disappears. I will not keep you any longer because I think I've bored you enough, but I would be quite happy to take questions about <laughs> this wine and for technical details, the brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as usual, Alessio has the mic, or will get the mic, uh, to take your question. Yes. I take it that we're using a natural fermentation, a yeast natural fermentation. Not the oh, yeah, we don't use any kind of commercial yeast. Um, and on the winery, we don't use any kind of commercial yeast. Uh, the attitude I have in winemaking is such that um, I feel like I'm a doctor. If the patient is healthy, I don't buy medicine for him. Uh, the only time I buy commercial yeast is if I have a block of fermentation. Then I need to find the medicine and then to get uh, the patient running because uh, the, uh, if I let nature take its course, it, the result would be worse than the buying commercially. So, only happened last time it happened was in uh, for one uh, vat in 2011 and for a couple of vats in 2004. So, but if the patient is healthy, uh, there's no need to buy any commercial yeast. And the problem with, as you know, the flavor of the wine is imparted by the yeast. So, if you buy commercial yeast, your wine will be similar to the other person that have bought the same commercial yeast. So uh, in the world of today where good wine is um, what my professor of math used to say, a necessary condition but not sufficient, you need to make distinctive wine. And in order to make distinctive wine, you have to work with things that other people don't work with, so. Other questions? Oh, is everybody waiting to booze now? <laughs> <laughs> there is a question over here. 
Well, I think this will be answered uh, in a minute by itself. Um, do, does the taste of this wine that you've made, is it lighter in flavor than the regular Sangiovese? Uh, is it... Uh... Well, I can tell you something. My brother can give you a technical detail, but being a blend of white and uh, white grapes and black grapes, it does have a lightness to it than you would have uh, compared to the regular straight Sangiovese, especially a very overly extracted Sangiovese that you would have in some Montalcinos, you see, in some Montalcino, but still the Sangiovese is very tannic, it's very tannic, it's the nature of the, of the grape, but this is less tannic and less, uh, it's, and Count Nicola Caponi said it's fresh and you can drink it, and you can drink it sort of per compagnia, which is an uh, interesting way of saying that you don't, have to, you don't have to write a treatise on it, you just enjoy the bloody thing, I mean. <laughs> yes. The, the way that the vines are planted, are you planting them in the traditional method or the albrabelli or the little trees, <laughs> or have you gone to the traditional horizontal method these days? Okay, um, the last four hectares of planted of Central Basis is all Alberello. Um, so that adds up to the two existing hectares of Alberello I had. So I have a total of six hectares of Alberello. Uh, it's a wonderful way of uh, growing the vines because uh, the, the grapes are much closer to the earth than on the, uh, than on the trellises system. And uh, there is also technical, uh, let's say that you always work with new, new wood. You don't have to go and cut the old wood like you have to do in spur cordon, especially on Sangiovese. And the, the only problem that Brello has is that it's not mechanizable. So uh, I have to balance out the, the poetry and I have to balance between the poetry and the practicality. And uh, so I have my estate, there are 27 hectares planted right now, uh, and there are 6 hectares of Alberello and 21 hectares of uh, trellises the vineyard. Uh, most of them are where are Guyot, because again, you're working with new wood and you're not working with old wood. And some of them are still a spur cordon. But spur cordon on Sangiovese, it's since Sangiovese is a grape variety that has very low uh, fertility. It's a grape variety that always uh, forces you, it's a grape, um, grape style of cultivation that always forces you to go back on your wood, and that's not a, always not a very good thing. So I would love to do all about forever, but uh, probably might cost food. Well, maybe one day. Depends how much I sell the wine for. <laughs> oh, by the way, this wine here is not for sale. We don't sell it. Uh, no, sorry. Yes, we only give it for we uh, give it and for how can I say, for <laughs> charitable auctions, on which we asked 1,613 of the currency as a starting point, you see. That is uh, always a, that is the, the yardstick. You can start with $1,613, or you don't even swat it, I mean, we don't care. But it has, that is the starting point. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you to everybody. Just could mention the, um, uh, in Chicago, Alex Lemonade stand, $2,000 for it. In, uh, in Michigan, for, an, uh, for a National Kidney Association, uh, $1,650. In, uh, in, um, in Detroit, and then uh, in, uh, in Poland for the Ex-Animal Association, which is uh, uh, the association that my sister uh, runs in Poland for, um, uh, is it leukemia, I think, yes. I believe, and that got, that was the highest bid, that was $2,500. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful, yeah. very good. Yeah. Very